opportunities to avoid the, those unintended consequences of uh, accidental events. But I don't think we should just say we're a lot smarter now than we were 100 years ago, and so we won't go down one of those pathways towards, uh, towards conflict, which could be extremely, um, extremely painful uh, uh, and uh, destructive. So those, those were a couple of, uh, for, for me, uh, takeaway comments. I also, uh, I was reflecting on, um, uh, again, as a dismal scientist, a uh, dismal economist, on Benjamin Franklin's um, uh, aphorism that uh, nothing is certain other than death and taxes. And in the context of what we've been discussing, uh, death and taxes have quite a big impact on how uh, the future um, uh, of the zone uh, uh, will pan out. Death is important because, uh, as was touched on uh, by Eleanor and, and Bernard, uh, there are going to be profound demographic changes in the zone over the next 35 years. Uh, today, the average age of the Chinese population is 30. By 2050, the average age will be 45, by which time one third of the Chinese population will be aged over 60. Now you might say, well, that's no great difficulty because a third, almost a third of the Japanese population is aged over 60, but it's the pace of change that is going to have uh, a big impact on, uh, on Chinese society. And this demographic change isn't just happening in China, even in India, the fertility rate is now barely above replacement rate. It's just at, at 2.2 um, uh, live births per, per couple, well under replacement rate in Vietnam, in, in Cambodia, in Thailand. Uh, why does this matter? Well, as the population ages, you see a reduction in the proportion of the working age population to the non-working age population. So even if you're not directing more resources, to the old population, you have to extract more from the working population to maintain your standard activities, education, the government services, defense, and so on. And as is likely with an aging population, all these countries will have to put more resource into supporting their elders uh, through income support uh, and healthcare. There is inevitably going to be more taxation, more impost on the working age population. So taxes will have to go up, and they'll have to go up quite fast and to quite a high level. Exactly the, the issue that uh, here in Australia, uh, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have been emphasizing over the last couple of weeks. Um, when taxes go up, um, typically, uh, the populace objects. So it seems to me there is a tension here between what is going to happen in terms of the demographic change and that pressure to, uh, to move towards a clearer democratic basis in society. Democracy is all very well for a regime and transitions to democracy from autocracy to democracy all very well as long as people vote the right way. But if the populace is angry because they're being taxed more, they are unlikely to vote the right way. And then on top of those sorts of pressures, we also see that the very nature of democratic politics is changing because of something that I think has not been mentioned once today, yet I think is of profound importance, and that's technology. We live in a technological age. Technology is changing very fast, and technology is changing the nature of democracy. It's doing so because people now can express their views readily, not just through the ballot box, but through social media. Now, in China, there are 591 million internet connections. 91% of the, those people who have an internet connection in China also engage in social media. On average, they do it 46 minutes a day. So we are seeing a fundamental change in the way in which the voice of the people can be expressed. How that adds up, how that impacts upon transitions from autocracy to democracy or from democracy light to de <laughs> democracy full scale, uh, I don't know. But we can already see in well-established democracies here in Australia, in the United States, 
Uh, social media is having a direct impact, that we're seeing a fragmentation of major parties and we're seeing the development of all sorts of small-scale interest groups that are establishing voice and then political power uh, within our democratic countries. I've no idea how this will pan out, but it does seem to me to be another layer of complexity that will impact upon uh, the, this tension between democracy and economic reform and development uh, within the zone. So those were just uh, a few of my reflections, but what about your reflections? Uh, you were asked at lunchtime today for uh, some opportunities. What did you think were the major opportunities that we uh, should um, uh, identify? And the key ones, uh, in no particular order, that uh, seem to come out of those cards, uh, opportunities to increase the, um, uh, the uh, export uh, market for Australia, uh, a particular opportunity around education and the export of skills and, uh, and um, uh, uh, skilled services uh, into the zone, uh, great opportunities for the development of the agricultural sector uh, in Australia, and um, all this leading to diversification of the Australian economy. You were asked to identify weaknesses and bottlenecks affecting our Australian capability. What might these be? Lack of cultural awareness um, uh, came up as, uh, uh, I think, the top of the list. Um, but then a whole range of internal issues, rigid labor rules, uh, uh, the the dead hand of regulation within the Australian market, um, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, the existence of trade barriers, though as, as we've heard that an awful lot of work is being done to uh, reduce those trade barriers in a, in a synchronized way across the zone. Um, and also um, perhaps a reluctance or a, a lack of um, agility on the part of Australian businesses to adapt rapidly to market demand. The priorities for action, um, you identified four of these. Um, negotiation um, of uh, trade access arrangements in order to open up new export markets, that's number one. Regulatory reform, uh, a second one. A third was the need for stronger and deeper connectivity between our nations through better bilateral engagement. Um, whether that be through regional organizations or uh, through other means. And then finally, and I don't know that this was anything that Richard or I wrote on those uh, lunchtime comments, but the fourth was investment in higher education and knowledge exchange. So I think we could, uh, we could say uh, absolutely we're supportive of that. So um, th those were comments from you, but also a few comments from me about the day. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the time is almost uh, running out, so um, if I could uh, perhaps share my own reflection um, regarding the forum that um, went on for the whole day today. It was indeed a, a solid day uh, of discussion and, and debate and exchange of opinions. Uh, but there are two things that I might want to say. One, one is about ASEAN, and ASEAN, perhaps unlike uh, EU, um, is normally considered as a market of labor force. But these days, it is not only a production base, but maturing into a market of a large pool of middle-income uh, people. Um, the market is growing, um, and so it would be an opportunity missed if uh, business sectors uh, do not fine-tune their uh, policies in uh, addressing uh, this uh, attractive market of uh, ASEAN. And um, the second uh, reflection would be uh, a sort of experience um, of Japan in regards to dealing with the ASEAN. Um, last year, in the year 2013, Japan celebrated the 40th anniversary of friendship and cooperation with the, the ASEAN. And um, notably, we think of ASEAN in terms of the uh, Fukuda Doctrine, uh, which was defined by the uh, former Prime Minister Fukuda in the 1970s in which he defined uh, Japan's relationship with ASEAN in terms of people-to-people -people, uh, relationship, heart-to-heart -heart, uh, relationship. And, and today, I have not seen uh, Prime Minister Abe define his um, uh, policies towards ASEAN except uh, in terms of economy. Uh, of course, uh, dealing with uh, other countries is not a charity, 
and everybody has to think of its own national interest. But I'm, I'm somewhat um, d disturbed in a way to see uh, a country to country or a country to region relationship just uh, being defined in terms of a growth strategy only. And, and there I was very much uh, impressed by the Australia's initiative in which uh, Foreign Minister um, Julie Bishop referred to as the new Colombo plan, where uh, there will be uh, uh, students from Australia uh, traveling to Asia um, for um, enriching their own experience firsthand. Um, I would like to think that the relationships would only, would only become a win-win relationship that is enduring um, when it is uh, supported by those people-to-people -people relationships. So um, I would believe that uh, there is a role for universities like yourself to play in that initiative, as well as the business sector. So thank you very much, everybody, for taking part in this forum, in the Zone Forum. It has been a big learning ex experience for me, and I hope that uh, you had a very rewarding day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for the panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, now my great pleasure to uh, formally bring the In The Zone 2014 conference to a close. I think we've all enjoyed some very stimulating discussion and uh, uh, very much appreciated the wealth of expertise brought to us by commentators from right across the zone, from India, China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Indonesia, and Australia. And uh, I think it shows that Perth is very much at the heart of Australia's pivot to the Indian Ocean and, and gateway to the Indo-Pacific region. In the Zone seeks to crystallize for a national audience the importance of, our changing, uh, of changing our perspective, our mindset, our attitudes about where Australia's future lies. Our aim is for everyone to leave this event with a deeper insight into the changing contours of power, prosperity, and opportunity in the Indo-Pacific Asian region. And this is, I think, uh, an important and necessary next step on the journey of engagement that Australia has, an Australian journey of engagement with this wider region. Um, we bring you this conference in partnership with the Australian newspaper and very much look forward to the production of a special report on In the Zone on Saturday the 10th of May. The report will include much of the commentary from today and uh, will uh, be another step towards accentuating WA's position uh, as a thought-leading state uh, within Australia. I uh, want to take this opportunity to thank a range of sponsors that have worked with the University of Western Australia um, to bring this conference together and to uh, achieve uh, these broad outcomes. Our principal partners are Murdoch University, the Perth US Asia Centre, the United States Sud Studies Centre and the Western Australian Government. I'd also like to acknowledge our gold and silver sponsors, Rio Tinto, Chevron, Wes Farmers, the City of Perth, Woodside, and also the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and Austrade, who have all provided significant support in realizing this event. I'd uh, further like to thank our esteemed editorial committee for assisting in the conception of the event. They include uh, our Chancellor, Michael Cheney, the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, the Premier, Colin Barnett, uh, Professor Stephen Smith, Ambassador Kim Beasley, Andrew Forrest, uh, Vice-Chancellor of Murdoch, uh, Richard Higgert, Barry Marshall, Rick Smith, Sue Boyd, Mark Barnaba, John Longerlant, and Paul Kelly, Editor-at-Large of The Australian. And my final thanks are to all of you in the room today um, who have enjoyed the discussion and who I hope are interested in continuing the In the Zone, in the zone uh, journey with us and continuing in all the um, environments in which uh, you work and operate, continue to emphasize the importance of Australia's engagement with the zone and ensuring that all your colleagues also continue to look north uh, with as much uh, clarity and perspicacity uh, as all our speakers have done today from uh, here in Perth.
Uh, please note that the In The Zone website will be full of content from today, videos, session transcripts and interviews, so please watch out for that. The um, uh, web address is over there, www.zone.uwa.edu.au. And uh, I'd now uh, like to invite you uh, to uh, uh, join us all for closing drinks at the Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery uh, for a, at the gallery for a special preview of another of our unique cross-cultural initiatives, the Transcending Borders exhibition, which has its opening night tomorrow night. And for those of you not familiar with the gallery, we have signposts and ushers uh, ready to guide you there. Thank you once again for attending. Please enjoy the rest of your evening and have a very safe travel back to your home, wherever that is. Thank you.